Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here with School Transportation News. We're glad you made it to the podcast. It's brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Also sponsored by our friends at the Propane Education Research Council, known as PERC, and Vera Mobility. Today, we've got a few guests for you. We have uh, Anna Banner, the Director of Transportation for Garland ISD in Texas, a recent winner of the TransFinder Top Transportation Teams Award. This is becoming a regular. I feel like a lot of top teams are coming on the podcast. What do you think, Ryan? Lots, lots of top teams. Good stuff. Lots of top teams. Are, uh, they have the uh, solution, I guess, if you want to call it that, to, uh, to a lot of the driver shortages and staff shortages. So uh, always eager to hear what they're doing. Yeah, wonderful. Also, we have a special guest, Patrick Dewing, the Director of Emergency Services for Broome County, New York. He's going to be talking to us about some safety solutions that they've deployed in the state of New York. Very interesting conversation there. A little later I'm having with him. But before we dive into it, got a message from TransFinder. Well, the votes are in and STN Expo attendees have spoken. TransFinder was overwhelmingly selected as the best software and best hardware for 2023 at STN Expo in Reno, Nevada. Yes, you heard that right. For the first time ever, TransFinder received the Innovation Choice Award for best hardware. And for the second year in a row, TransFinder has won the best software award, adding to numerous past awards transfinder has won for its software products transfinders move into hardware was driven by client demand transfinder now provides the tablet the mounts the card reader and more as part of its one partner one solution approach guys you can learn more by visiting transfinder.com or calling them at 800-373-3609 or email them at getplus at transfinder.com and make sure you put STN podcast in the subject line. All right, we're back. Editorial extraordinaire, Ryan Gray. Talk to me, the headlines. Ryan, are you feeling the pinch at the pump? I don't know. I've noticed my gas prices are going up. I assume the fleet prices are going up. Fuel is always kind of this commodity where the prices are going up and down. I, usually the summertime, I feel like prices go up, but right now I, prices are high, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, certainly if you've uh, filled up the tank, like you said, um, I mean, I think out here in California, it's always, you know, we're paying what a dollar 10 to dollar 20 more on average. Taxes. Th- those taxes get us, Ryan. Yeah. Th- more than everybody mm-hmm. else. Uh, you know, yeah, the, uh, the, the different regulations and mandates we have in here, uh, here in California. Um, but yeah, certainly when you're looking at the, the, at the pump prices, I mean, as we're recording this, uh, U.S. the the price of of, uh, of regular diesel is about four sixty three a gallon. Um, of course, out here in California, it's like over six dollars. Um, you know, it, it's just uh, you know crazy. And and now, granted, like you said, school districts um, hopefully are paying some bulk prices a little bit less um, than that, but still going up. Um, you know, there's been some things we've seen out of OPEC uh, where they are uh, reducing supply of course russia there's that whole mess gone going on over there um that have, has been going on for now two years and tied to um the ukraine so you know really uh folks uh trying to trying to get the most they can out of uh their fueling uh, and, you know hopefully uh you guys got some good uh, strategies out there for for dealing with those increasing costs Yeah, and I know last week, Ryan, we really came across an interesting headline. State of California passed through the state legislature uh, to mandate electric school buses for the entire state. Now, we haven't seen this yet. Obviously, New York has made a big play with this, Ryan. And I know there's been apprehension, opposition. Um, You know, some people love it. Some people don't. Uh, I think the industry is uh, up in arms a little bit because they don't think it's a one size fits all solution. And, you know, I know uh, California, if I read it right, it says zero emission and electric school buses. So hopefully that would apply to propane or some other sources as well, because we don't know by 2035 what that's going to look like because uh, of some of the things we've talked about at our green bus summit. Uh, this has been a very big discussion point. So what's your take on this uh, 
legislative pass. And Governor Newsom at this recording, if I'm not mistaken, is reviewing the documents and uh, taking comment. I'm not really sure if he's taking comment from anybody or he's just going to do his thing. Yeah, he's not really taking comment. I mean, he's got till October 14th to sign all the bills that were passed by the legislature this session. Uh, yeah, I, I did hear that as we're recording this, he, it was on his desk. He was looking at it. Uh, hopefully by the time this uh, podcast comes out, uh, we will already have word on if he signed it or not. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, California uh, joining the likes of New York as well as Connecticut, Maine, and Maryland. And all these states, they have slightly different mandates, right? I think New York is the most strict or, or you know, or more stringent regulations. Uh, but basically what California would do under AB 579 is that uh, all uh, new purchases of school buses as of January 1st, 2035 would need to be zero emission. So as you pointed out, right now that means electric. We don't know what that's going to mean, you know, 12 years from now uh, or whatever that is, 11 and a, 11 and a half years from now. Uh, but um, what we do know from the bill is that uh, school districts would have essentially a, a five year window um, where they could get an extension on that requirement. But they need to prove that uh, electric would not be feasible to their routing, to their local geography, uh, and they would only get a five-year extension. So now AB 579 would require by 2045 that all fleets of school buses would be 100% zero emissions. Uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll see if uh, Governor Newsom passes this. Now, he has previously supported uh, the, the move to zero emissions. He, of course, uh, signed uh, an executive order a few years ago uh, that uh, mandated um, all medium and heavy duty trucking and busing. Not school buses would be, are, have been exempt from that because the California Air Resources Board regulates yellow buses separately. Um, but he has already gone on record and called for um, you know zero emissions in the commercial fleet. Uh, so. Likely he's going to to pass this now. Uh, surprisingly or not, um, it's not supported by everybody. Uh, so I, I spoke last week uh, with uh, Tasha Davenport, who's the executive director of the California Association of School Business Officials. They work very closely with the California Association of School Transportation Officials, CASTO. Uh, so they are opposing this bill. They're saying essentially, hey, one size does not fit all. You can't. You just you know, shoehorn in all school buses under this bill to make them all zero emissions. Um, they cite the extreme weather conditions we've been having out here in California, the frequent wildfires that we have, power shutoffs, um, buses being trapped due to inclement weather. Um, they they mention there's a you know lack of infrastructure right now for repair and services. Um, not enough charging stations. They talk about the high price of electric school buses, $450,000. Um, and then, you know, also too, back to the electric grid, they, they actually mention uh, CASBO does putting student safety at risk uh, because school buses are needed to evacuate uh, communities and schools in a time of crisis and time of emergency. And with the grid um, kind of in flux right now, Will there be enough charge? So there's a lot of concern out there and voicing a lot of concern that a lot of our readers have voiced. Um, so, you know, uh, but what we do know is that this bill was passed by the legislature um, and, you know, it, it's sign of sign of things to come. I think for districts all across the nation, look at what your legislators are, are doing and talking about electric school buses. Um, how involved are you or your state associations in that those efforts? You know, talking to the legislatures, sharing the concerns as well as the wins that electric buses are having. Ryan, uh, what's what's our take? What do you think? How many buses are in California? How many school bus? Six thousand? Seven thousand? Try twenty four thousand. Twenty four thousand. That's a lot. So yeah. let's do the math on that a little bit. I mean, uh, I think we're talking about what ten billion dollars almost. That's got to be, if you did 400,000 and you multiplied that, it's got to be close to that. And that's almost as much as the federal subsidy 
for all Mm -hmm. of the United States. So guess who is probably going to have to pay for that if that passes? Yep. The taxpayer, yep. right? Because school districts can't be burdened with that cost. So also we've got the idea of supply chain. Could could demand actually be met, right? Could the OEMs, if they supply, and California is not the only state supplying these buses, right? But let's just say 24,000, what's the replacement cycle? I mean, really, you said about 11 years. That means- 2,000 to 2,400 buses a year, you know? It's a big number. Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know uh, what that replacement uh, cycle is because California, again, is a state that does not have a replacement plan. You know, they don't, they, they, they've they really been utilizing a lot of the, the grant funds over the last 15 years, you know, from the likes of California Resources Board and others, California Energy Commission, um, to uh, replace a lot of school buses. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago that California was kind of, you know, trading back and forth with states like South Carolina, who had the the oldest uh, age of school buses in the nation. Um, So, you know, obviously those grant funds have done a lot to move the needle. But, you know, what we've talked about, too, is how sustainable are these grant funds? You know, we know at a certain point these are going to sunset. We know the EPA Clean School Bus Program only has a few more years. I mean, we're essentially heading into about the halfway point, right? Um, We're going to be hearing about the year two rebate program here in a matter of weeks, um, if not days. Uh, So uh, but, you know, we're we're about to to enter into 2024. This EPA program runs through 2026. So we're about at that halfway point. Uh, We know that really this is all seed money. We've talked about that. At a certain point, the feds are going to say and the states are going to say, okay, you know, Um, and, and the whole point is that it's trying to get industry to the point where there's diesel parity or there's, there's parity with diesel. And we know that obviously diesel is being mandated out. Uh, you mentioned a great point there, Tony, with propane earlier, that really has been uh, the the leader in green uh, buses over the last decade. Um, I think that that's going to continue to get greener, um, but it's going to take time. And I think the hope is again, that over these next, you know, 11, 12 years, we're going to not only see, uh, battery uh, prices fall. I mean, we we talked about the the big news of the of the joint venture between uh, Cummins um, and their Accelera uh, by Cummins Zero Emissions uh, Group, along with Packer and uh, Daimler Trucks, with that big battery plant that they're they're developing. It's all all of this is designed to try to bring the cost down. Of course, you know, just get get the production levels up to where they need to be, um, so that we are no longer having to pay $450,000 for an electric school bus. Maybe, you know, they're going to be $250,000 in, you know, five, 10 years. Um, we, we see the diesel school buses are getting to about that, that um, price now. Um, so certainly things are getting more expensive. Uh, it just is going to be a matter of trying to, to reach that point where things really make sense both from an operational and a, and a price perspective. Yeah, we're definitely seeing innovation, right? So I think that it's clear that the infrastructure is not there. And there's a lot of people that are deeply concerned about being forced, right? We're being pulled probably as an industry a lot faster than we want to move. This industry obviously over the years has taken a very judicious approach to examining, vetting, looking at it. And, you know, we're at the front, you know, we're being pulled along as fast as we can by these legislators to move it forward. I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? What do you think Newsom signs it? 50-50? Or you think it's really like, I mean, this is part of the initiative in California to be Mm -hmm. green. I mean, this is in lockstep, right? I, I just, I don't know. I just don't see this not getting signed. I think it would be highly unlikely. I think it's a foregone conclusion. Frankly, um, I was just as you were talking, kind of thinking of, you know, percentage and I, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, 80, 20 is even uh, too low. I mean, I think it's probably 99 percent. I mean, I could be wrong. I've been wrong a few times um, uh, more than I'd like to admit, but uh, I would I would venture the guess that he is going to pass this. Uh, you know, again, I, I think that the. The rubber will meet the road, so to speak, on, um, you know, what happens going forward. 
in terms of how is this law implemented and a, a lot too on, you know, propane. Um, and, you know, are there other fuels or, you know, from a standpoint of looking at uh, a hydrogen fuel cell, um, if, if you're giving yourselves, a, you know, a, a 10 year, 12 year leeway, uh, the folks we talk to hydrogen fuel cell most likely is not going to fully power uh, school buses, extremely expensive. I mean, right now it's, you know, you buy one of these fuel cell transit buses, it's a million bucks. That's just, I mean, if you think $450,000 for an electric school bus is bad, I mean, you know, don't even, <laughs> don't even look at hydrogen fuel cell for school buses. Um, but, you know, some of the folks we've talking to hydrogen fuel cell, and there's other uh, technologies out there uh, that are emerging that look to extend uh, the range of electric school buses and maybe in lockstep along with electric coming down um, could be um, a viable response to some of the concerns that Casbo laid out there in terms of, you know, the grid um, and, and operational and safety issues. Uh, so, you know, I, I, again, there's just a lot we don't know. We're still so much looking at the crystal ball, trying to prognosticate and predict what's going to happen. Um, you know, technology will go where technology goes. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of innovation out there, like you mentioned. And, you know, something that sticks with me too is an OEM uh, told me um, earlier this year, hey, if regulators get out of our way, we can do some great stuff. Um, and, and we know, you know, that, uh, you know, look at the, the, the past, you know, 120 years of vehicle development and innovations. I mean, you know, the diesel engine, if you go back 150 years, 120 years, 110 years, that that was, you know, quite quite the conversation starter. As you said, now here we are heading into 2024, you know, we're a quarter of the way almost into the 21st century and there's a lot that's that's coming folks and, you know, all we can do is do the best to try to understand what those technologies, what those innovations will mean to our our operations, to our industry, and get the word out. Talk to folks. So like I mentioned earlier, get in front of your legislators and make sure that they understand how school buses run and how they operate, the, you know, the constraints that school districts are under um, and, and what you need to be successful. Because again, folks... And especially the politicians, I think this was what will resonate with them. There's so much money out there right now that's being thrown at zero emissions vehicles. We need to make this successful. Uh, and, and by doing that, we need to, to tell the story and, and get to those folks who control the purse strings, you know, share with them what you need to make this successful. I think that, you know, we're really uh, open some eyes and, uh, and hopefully um, we'll get them to uh, place priorities where they need to be. Yeah, well, great segue to our next sponsor, the Propane Education Research Council. Love to hear a message from them all about what they're doing in the world of propane. All right, guys, we have a great green tip for you this week brought to you by the Propane Education Research Council. They want to talk to you about propane it's energy for everyone. Did you know that school buses fueled by propane can help you reduce emissions in your community while saving you money? Propane school buses have a lower average carbon intensity than electric school buses over their lifetime by more than half. And they emit up to 96% less nitrogen oxide than diesel buses. All of this from fleets with the lowest total cost of ownership it's no wonder propane is the most widely used alternative fuel in the school bus industry. You guys can learn more at betterourbuses.com. That's betterourbuses.com. All right, guys, coming up next, I'm talking to Patrick Dewing. He's talking about how he's using the Vera Mobility Safety Suite of products in Broome County, New York. Really interesting interview. You got to listen. All right, School Transportation Nation, we're excited to bring together a really great thought leader, Patrick Dewing from Broome County, New York. He's the Director of Emergency Services. Patrick, welcome to the podcast, man. Hey, thank you for having me. 
Absolutely. So, so tell me a little bit about Broom County uh, for those that listeners that aren't familiar with you out in New York. What's your what's your school bus volume look like? How many students you transport? Tell me a little bit about the school. Oh, absolutely. So Broome County, New York is in uh, upstate New York. We have a population of around 200,000 people. Uh, There's 13 different school districts and we have over 400 buses on the road transporting students to school every single day. 400 buses is quite a few buses. Do you find that illegal passing is a challenge for you in Broome County? Absolutely. Uh, We became aware of the problem from the school districts and the bus drivers themselves who on a daily basis kept reporting that, you know, they had several vehicles pass their bus with a stop arm extended every single day. And when that problem was identified, we at Broom County want to take action. And we've seen between 200 and 300 violations every single month. Well, yeah, I know it's been a big issue. It's been talked a lot about the National School Transportation Association and uh, many other associations, uh, NASDIPS, which is State Director Association. We all have kind of looked at some of the data on the reporting. And I think, you know, it's around 43, 44 million illegal passes is what they're extrapolating nationwide happening. And I mean, it's just an astronomical number. Now, in New York, I know there's legislation to allow stop arm camera programs, which might help mitigate some of these challenges. Now, it's my understanding you partnered with Vera Mobility to implement this type of program. Can you share kind of like what are the key factors, what decisions were made at the district level? And, you know, how did you actually get this over the finish line and launch the program? So, yeah, absolutely. As I said, we've been we started receiving uh, complaints from school districts and bus drivers alike of just the sheer number of violations that are occurring every single day. And as you know, every time a driver illegally passes a school bus, the stop arm extended, it's a chance of a child being critically injured or killed. So Broome County really wanted to be a part of that solution and keeping our children safe. So uh, when that state legislation was passed, Broome County quickly took action and we partnered with the Broome County Executive's Office and the Broome County Legislator to enact a local charter and code that extended beyond that state legislation that allowed us locally to outfit all of the buses in Broome County with cameras that automatically capture violations that occur. Excellent. And then what are some of the um, elements of that program? So when you set it up to launch it, there's obviously a, a ticketing component. There's other elements of that. Can you explain the the program a little bit just because I think our listeners want they're very curious because when someone implements this there's a lot of things like you saying you're working with the county to get over the line and then put it out like can you share a little more about the program details Absolutely. So as I started with the executive's office and the legislator to get that local law enacted, once we had that local law enacted, we worked with uh, Vera Mobility to complete a very comprehensive business rules questionnaire, which is basically, as you said, the meat and potatoes of how this system is going to work. Um, and the way our system works is when a violation occurs, which takes no action by the driver of the school bus, it's all automated. So as soon as that stop arm goes out, the camera in motion is activated. Any vehicle that passes that bus, a picture is taken of it prior to passing, during it passing, and after it's passed, as well as it takes a, about a 10 second video clip. All of that information is processed and stored right there on the bus. It's sent to Vera Mobility via a secure VPN. They verify that all the information matches, that the license plate matches the vehicle and matches the correct color. And then once all of that's processed, it's sent over to our team here locally, which is Broome County Government Division of Security. There are law enforcement partners. They review that information, basis of checks and balances to make sure everything that Vera verified is being verified again by a law enforcement officer. Once they approve those violations, uh, they accept them, which sends it back to Vera Mobility. Vera Mobility then prints out a notice of liability and that notice of liability is sent to the registered owner of the vehicle on that notice it's a two-page more or less a two-page ticket it has pictures of the violation it has all the information about the violation it even has a link for the individual to log in and 
watch the video of the violation taking place. And from there, the registered owner can either opt to pay the fine or they can opt to request an administrative hearing in a court. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty comprehensive program there to execute. And uh, I'm betting you see some behavioral changes once they get that ticket for sure, right? Absolutely. Uh, recidivism in Broome County is less than 1%. So people that have been found liable in court, less than 1% of them go on to commit a second offense. Interesting. Now, how did you go about building public awareness and education about safety around the school buses? And obviously the Vera Mobility Program, uh, I'm sure they were a partner in helping you develop some tactics to help get the word out. Can you explain expand a little more on kind of what was the process and how did you engage stakeholders to kind of build out that public awareness campaign? Absolutely. Uh, Variable Billy was a fantastic partner. They, uh, they built out messaging and um, educational materials for us, as well as infographics. With those educational materials, we actually partnered with the school districts themselves, and we had them sent home with the students to the parents so parents could, A, be aware that we started this program and have a little more information, as I explained before, about how the program actually works. Um, you know, transparency in government is uh, essential to gain the public trust. So that's really what we did. We had news conferences. We had press releases. We really leveraged our um, social media accounts, uh, either Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to share information about the program. Uh, we also shared different infographics of you know, violations we're starting to see. Some people, for instance, we were not aware that you couldn't pass a school bus with a stop bar extended on a divided highway. But here in New York, that is still unlawful. All four lanes of traffic need to stop. So those type of infographics really were a huge educational element, and I think really produced a difference. Wonderful. And then were there any other additional benefits that you saw as outcomes from the program that really helped adjust the behavior of people that were illegally passing the school buses? And, and kind of what, what has that really meant to the community? I think it's meant so much to the community. I said there was a, we definitely identified an educational gap. There were things that people simply didn't know. They knew on a two lane road, you weren't supposed to pass a school bus, but sometimes people were confused at four way or three way intersections. So that being able to go out there and educate them, immediately we saw a difference. And when we really drive the message homes about keeping our children safe, that you know every time a violation occurs, there's a chance for a student to be critically injured or killed. It drives that message home and people really understand it that it you know take a couple extra minutes be safe on the roadway it's about saving lives and keeping our children safe yeah i mean could you share any like maybe a story or maybe some statistics that kind of demonstrated the positive impact of of this campaign I, you know, stories I've heard a lot from my team who actually go out to court and try these. You know, some people get this violation. They're just confused by the program and they call a court case together, not because they want to fight the violation. They want to better understand it. And, you know, some people go into court and they're very upset that this even happened. They never met to it. They understand that they need to be more vigilant on the road. And you know, they're quite upset that they even committed the violation of law and they, they themselves put a child at danger. So. I think we see a lot of that in court. Um, as for the statistics and numbers, I am happy to say that we've seen a 16% decrease in the number of violations between 2022 and 2023 thus far. Well, that's inspiring. Well, that's exciting. I'm glad, uh, you know, the stakeholders have really got on board with this program and really embraced it. And you're seeing some positive outcomes for your, your children, your community. Um, obviously it's about saving lives and really, you know, making sure you set up the right technology program, public awareness campaign, and really making that felt. And I'm sure many of these people have been long time since they took that DMV test. So they they don't know necessarily the rules of the road. So obviously public awareness is a paramount. And I love the idea of sending home uh, collateral to the parents of the children because I'm a parent. Parents talk, right? Like, hey, did you see this thing that they sent home about what's going on on the school bus? So I love that sort of thing. The kind of grassroots approach is super smart. So uh, bravo, bravo, Patrick. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh, and sharing with us about this uh, innovative uh, safety program with uh, Vera Mobility and, and everything that you're doing to help your community. Well, thank you very much for having me.
Great conversation, Patrick. Thanks for jumping on. Coming up next, Taylor Ekbatani and Anna Banner from Garland ISD, Texas. Taylor, take it away. All right, guys, so Taylor here, and I want to introduce a, another awesome guest with us on the podcast, a, another top transportation team winner. So today we have Anna Marie Banner. She's the Director of Transportation for Garland ISD in Texas. So welcome, Anna. It's uh, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much, Taylor. It's great to be here. So I know we also talked for another article, which is coming out in the October issue. So you guys stay tuned for that. But it was talking about school startup and you guys started, I think you just told me August 8th. So it's been a little, little over a month, but how did that go for you guys? It went really well this year. Um, We had our, one of our best startups this year. We did start the year, a few drivers short. So that was a challenge for us. Um, and we didn't know that they were not going to be here. So that's also another challenge. But we did work through it and we made it, we made it through. I think you're underplaying it a little bit. You, I remember you told me you had 20 drivers not show up to your first in-service. So you actually started the year almost 30 drivers short. So We did. We started the year 40 drivers short, actually. So, uh, you know, just coverage from last year we knew that we were going to be short they didn't show up for whatever reason you know move took another position and just failed to tell us and we knew about a week before school started Um, it takes about six weeks to get a cdl you know if you're just new coming in so that made uh, the start of school quite challenging Yeah, I could imagine. And I know you guys also adopted some new routing software as well. So that kind of helped alleviate some of the challenges you guys experienced. We did. We um, have TransFinder now and we have all the finders. It's been really amazing to watch that, you know, work as far as you can look up information and know exactly who's right by it and maybe who could pick up that other run for us. And it tells us, you know, if the bus is going to be overcrowded based on who's assigned to the bus. So that's been, that was very helpful at the start of school and combining the runs. Mm -hmm. So you guys still short 40 drivers? We are not efficiently with TransFinder. We've condensed some routes. So we've been able to, I don't want to say get rid of, that's a harsh word, but, you know, combined. So we were down 14 and also, so combining those, getting rid of 14. We're currently about 20 short now. So about half. Okay. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. And I know even though you had these, you know, driver shortage challenges, you said this was your most successful start in your, you know, 26 years in transportation. And you attributed that to communication. So can you talk about the communication aspect and why that's so important? We, We did. So when you implement the new, the TransFinder, the routing software, it looks different for the team. Um, like I said, we did all the finders. So we have the Wayfinder, which helps the drivers with, with their tablets. Before they were using paper maps and they had to look at the maps to know where they were going. And the tablet gives them directions right and left. That really helped. We communicated with the campuses um, you know, ahead of time to say, this is what we're doing. This is what it looks like. We gave them the information ahead of time on how to look up students for themselves because before they had to call us to do everything. And, you know, we have 53,000 students in Garland. We transport about 19,000. Um, started out with about 300 routes. So communication was really key for us in just letting the campuses know, the parents know, you know, the new programming that we had before we were able to communicate with them through Twitter and with the stop finder, they were able to have access to their students' bus routes and know when the bus was coming. That was so helpful because you can do that bus specific. Getting the word out to the parents, to the community, to the to the campuses was was really key, I think, in having a better start to the school year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's huge. And you guys can read more about this in the October issue. Uh, like I said, it'll be dropping in a couple of days. So definitely check that out. But I want to dive a little bit more into you, Anna. So you said 26 year career. What does that look like? Well, I started out driving a bus in the late 90s. 
got my CDL. Um, I had three kids at the time. I actually have four now. <laughs> and just, I started out driving a bus. I worked my way up. I was, you know, a trainer, lead trainer, dispatcher, operations supervisor, assistant director, and just worked my way up, took a million classes, it felt like, member of TAPT, NTAPT, TASBO. I have my certification, director certification through the NAPT, which is the National Association of Pupil Transportation. And that really helped a lot. And as I was going up through the the ranks, if you will, I saw a lot of things that I thought we could improve on as a transportation community, you know, just how you treat people, how you want to be treated, and what would make a great environment to, to work in. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, seeing that uh, led you to become one of the top transportation teams through TransFinder. So obviously culture is very important to you guys at, at Garland. And so how did that shift or how did you kind of promote culture in your department? I've been in Garland a little over a year only. Um, so when I got here, I think the most important thing was just to take a step back to see what the culture was like, what they were used to, how, you know, what kind of programs that we, they were using and just trying to see where we could make that better. So for me, it was getting, you know, the buy-in from the staff first what does that look like? You know, are, are you treating each other with respect? Are you being nice? I, I call it being fluffy. And that that's, they got t-shirts that said fluffy, you know, that's what they, they think it's funny. And, you know, it's about how you email back and forth. And then once you have staff buy-in, you take that to your drivers and your monitors and your mechanics, right? What, what do they want to do? What does that look like? Where do they see us going in the future? And just really empowering people to make decisions in a good way, in a fluffy way, if you will, for the Mm -hmm. department. So, wow. Only being there, you know, about a year, what made you want to do, you know, the top transportation team, you know, criteria? I think it was a survey and all that stuff. Um, You really put yourself out there. I did. Yeah. (laughs) I, you know, for me, when I got here, it was just, I could see where a huge difference could, could be made. And it really boils down to being nice. I, I drive a Jeep. I have a thing on the back of my Jeep. It says in a world when you can be anything, be kind. And it really starts there. You're nice to one person. And I know there's a lot more to transportation than just being nice. But if you want to, you know, change your culture, that's really kind of where you need to start. You need to start with treating people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really important. So did you see the drivers shift, you know, and and kind of take on that, that kind mentality? I, yes, I did. It actually, it took a few months, believe it or not. They, there's a lot of distrust when that's kind of what they're used to. Right. And so when you start asking them, what do you want? Like, what, what would make you want to work here? What would make you want to tell your, your friends, Hey, come work here because this is a really awesome place. What does that look like for you? And they started just saying, well, you know, we don't, we don't have parties and we don't, we don't get recognized for the work that we do. So I created hero of the day, if you will. So when campuses or parents call in and say, Hey, that driver did something awesome. I call them out over the radio and say our hero of the day is, and they get to come in and pick a prize. We started um, also little squishy buses as Garland ISD on them. And we created tags that say you've been busted for being awesome. So anytime, you know, anybody calls in or just has a great comment to say about a bus driver. So I focus more on the positive versus the negativity. You know, yeah, we might have an accident, but I don't put that on the radio, right? I'm putting your, your busted for being awesome. And then we take pictures, we put it on Facebook and we tweet it out, whatever that we need to do just to kind of get the word out that we're recognizing. And we do 
you know, the route is right even. So if people help out morning and afternoon, they get their name goes into a raffle and we play the price is right music and we pick a name and they win the price is right. The route is right for that day for helping out. So it's really like the recognition. Uh, we started an activity committee and so we, we have an activity calendar. We do not only just activities that, you know, some things cost money, but in a lot of districts, you can't afford that. And we really can't afford that here either. So we worked with the community to find a yoga instructor, a, um, a get fit, what we call it, an exercise. And we do that a couple times a week. Lunches, just things like that to make this a great place to work. So people want to work here just to be recognized. That's awesome. That was a lot of explanation. <laughs> I, I love that. I love the get busted buses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's really amazing how just a little squishy bus goes so far. <laughs> well, I know I have like 10 all over squishy buses, right? So they're, <laughs> they're definitely collectibles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People get, they're proud when they get those. So yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's funny because, you know, with recognition, we were joking before the podcast that you've, your district and you yourself have gotten a lot of recognition since the top transportation team. So I'm sure this is, you know, filling drivers even more now with, with pride. Yes. Yeah. They, when I got back from winning that award, you know, they wanted a shadow box to put the award in. They want to put it on there, you know, we all in, in staff internally, we have it all on our email. When we email out, they are super proud of it. And the drivers and monitors just, that's what they were saying when we got started school is we're the top transportation team in the nation. And we do get lots of people coming in that want to work for us because we won the award. Like we have a lot of neighboring districts, Texas is pretty big, but they want to work here because they hear that we're one of the top teams. Yeah. And you just sat on a, a webinar as well with TransFinder talking, you know, you know, more about best practices and about culture as well, or? Right. Same, okay. same type of things that we, we talked about. And it's, you know, it's nice that a lot of districts have reached out to say, how do we do that? How do we, how did you get started? Mm -hmm. Where can I get this? Where, you know, where, where do we find the buses? Where, and a lot of it is just creativity that we make ourselves because I don't come up with all the ideas too, right? I mean, it's your, it's your staff that's coming up with these great ideas to make it a great place to work. And that's, that's what's helpful is it's not just me. It's the team, right? You're, you're giving them buy-in and ownership and what's happening. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I know we saw you in Reno, but uh, I think Garland's a little outside of Dallas. So are you or any of your team members uh, coming down to TSD? We have a couple of people that are actually going from our special needs team and they're excited to go and are, have already signed up and they're ready. <laughs> I love to hear it. <laughs> They, uh, all the classes, you know, I'm a big advocate of taking classes and learning, continuing education, no matter what, you know, I think that that's important, especially in the industry that changes so much. It's important for all of us to, to know that there's other things out there than what is just internally in your own department. And they're really excited about that. I offered to pay for the classes for them to go because I want them to know how important it is that they continue their education as well. Yeah. And that's the TSD conference. So that's in November and Ryan, Ryan Gray is working on our schedule as we speak. So the agenda should be online shortly, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. TSD is one of my favorite conferences. It's a great time. Yeah, it is. It's really nice. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anna. I appreciate you jumping on the podcast and sharing your thoughts. And I'm happy to hear that you had a great school startup. And I, I hope it's, you know, great for every day hereafter. Thank you so much. And it's cooler. So that's all we're asking for. <laughs> <laughs> Not much, but a little cooler. A special thanks to Ryan Gray, Taylor Ekbatani, Patrick Dewing, Anna Banner. All great conversations today on the podcast. Appreciate y'all coming on. We appreciate our sponsors today, TransFinder, the Propane Education Research Council, and Vera Mobility. Guys, you can listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, 
wherever you listen to the pods. We're coming up almost 200 episodes. We're we're a few away, but I feel like it's getting closer and closer. Uh, also, don't forget our October issue is coming up. It'll drop on Sunday on the website, and we'll send out some emails uh, subsequently after that. But great issue about leaders. I know we got stuff on rising stars in the industry. There's a lot of great content coming up on the TSD conference as well. Don't forget to sign up for that November 15th through the 20th down in Frisco, Texas. It's going to be a great time. Guys, we love you nation. We'll see you next week. Take care. Take care.